What I want to do in this video is tell you about the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian, or normal distribution, is easily the most important distribution in all of machine learning and statistics. I think everybody has some amount of intuition about the Gaussian distribution based on the idea of the bell curve. But there's really a lot more to the Gaussian distribution than just its classic bell shape. For example, some of the reason the Gaussian is so important is due to the central limit theorem. Now I've talked about the CLT in more detail in another video, but here when I talk about the importance of the Gaussian distribution, I want to use this as a sort of motivating case. The central limit theorem says that sums of independent random variables from essentially any distribution with a finite mean invariance will converge to a Gaussian distribution. This remarkable result tells us right away that the Gaussian must be special, and so that's why it's getting its own video. We'll start out by looking at the univariate Gaussian distribution, which is defined just on the real line. One important property that is really useful for Gaussians is that they're closed under linear transformation. That is, if I have a Gaussian random variable with mean mu and variance sigma squared, and I multiply that random variable by a constant a and add a constant b, then I get a new random variable that is also Gaussian distributed. The new mean is a times mu plus b, and the new variance is a squared times sigma squared. That is, the new mean is the linear transformation applied to the old mean, and a amplifies the variance by a factor of a squared. Another remarkable fact is that if I take two independent Gaussian random variables and add them together, then I get a new random variable that is also Gaussian. The mean of the sum is the sum of the means, and the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. The difference between two Gaussian random variables is also Gaussian. The mean of the difference is the difference of the means, but the variances add. With that univariate warm-up, let's now take a look at the multivariate Gaussian distribution on Rn. It has two parameters, a mean vector mu in Rn and an n by n positive definite covariance matrix, typically written sigma. The probability density function of the multivariate Gaussian is defined by a quadratic form. It's essentially the squared L2 distance defined by the difference between x and mu under the metric defined by inverse sigma. The normalization constant has to account for the fact that space is being squished or expanded by sigma, and so involves the determinant of sigma. As in the univariate case, the multivariate Gaussian is closed under linear transformation. If I take a Gaussian random vector x, and I hit it with a matrix A and then add a vector B, I get another Gaussian, assuming the dimensions match up. As before, the mean of the transformation is the transformation of the mean. The covariance of the transformation takes sigma and hits it on the left with A and on the right with A transpose. As in the univariate case, sums and differences of multivariate Gaussian vectors are also Gaussian. The mean of the sum is the sum of the means, and the mean of the difference is the difference of the means. In both cases, the covariance is the sum of the previous covariances. One of the things that makes the multivariate Gaussian distribution so remarkable is that the conditionals and marginals are easy to compute and also Gaussian. So imagine that I had a Gaussian random variable bold x, and I wanted to ask about the marginal of the first entry, x1. In general, this kind of marginalization would involve integrating out all of the other components of the vector. This might be a very challenging thing to do, both from a mathematical point of view and from a computational point of view. But for a Gaussian, it's easy. You just throw away the parameters that aren't involved in the marginal you care about. So in this case, for x1, you would just grab the mean mu1 and that one entry of the covariance matrix. This turns out to be true for multivariate marginals as well. If I want to ask about the subvector x1, x2, all I have to do is restrict my attention to the relevant subvector of the mean and the relevant submatrix of sigma. This turns out to be an incredibly useful property. In fact, there are objects called Gaussian processes in which it's possible to marginalize away an infinite number of other dimensions. Conditional distributions are also easy. Let's imagine that you wanted to ask about the conditional distribution of x1 and x2 given all the other variables, which I'll call y. We could break up the mean vector into two pieces one that's relevant to x1 and x2, and one that's relevant to y. The same partitioning gives us four pieces for sigma. In the upper left is the marginal covariance for x1 and x2, and the bottom right is the marginal covariance for y. The bottom left and the upper right are actually transposes of each other, and they are the cross covariances between x1, x2, and y. 
With these pieces in hand, all we have to do is a little bit of linear algebra in order to compute the mean and covariance of the conditional distribution. Now I think it's worth taking a minute to try to get a little bit of geometric intuition for the covariance matrix. What I'm showing you here are isocontours of a bivariate Gaussian distribution. In our most basic case, we have an identity covariance matrix. This is the product of two standard normal random variables with mean zero and variance one. In this case, we'll get spherical isocontours. We can also scale the identity and still get something spherical. This corresponds to independence, but with shared variances. I should point out that different sigmas will make this taller or flatter in order to make sure that it integrates to one, but this isn't shown with the isocontours. The next step up in complexity is to allow the covariance matrix to be a positive definite diagonal matrix. This means that the components are still independent, but now they have different variances. So here, the isocontours tend to be axis-aligned ellipsoids. In full generality, covariance matrices can be any positive definite matrix. So now the isocontours will be ellipsoids, but they'll be oriented in some arbitrary direction. When I'm learning about a probability distribution, I always find it helpful to think about how I would generate variates from it. That is, how I could take uniform pseudo-random variates from my computer and turn them into the distribution of interest. Before we do that, though, it's worth meeting a close friend of the Gaussian distribution, the chi-squared distribution. If I take a bunch of samples from a standard normal distribution, square them, and then sum them, I get a chi-squared random variate. Along the bottom here, I'm showing a standard normal density, and then in orange, I'm showing the parabola for x squared. The idea here is to think about what would happen if I drew some random variates from the blue density and then pass them through the orange function. If I did this with one standard normal random variate, I would get something like the density that I'm showing vertically on the left. The parameter for the chi-squared distribution is the number of standard normal random variates whose squares I add together. This parameter is conventionally called the degrees of freedom of the chi-squared distribution. Here I'm showing how that distribution changes with increasing degrees of freedom. Interestingly, it turns out that the chi-squared distribution is a reduced parameterization of the gamma distribution. Of particular relevance to us here is that when the number of degrees of freedom is two, it is the exponential distribution. So now that we know that fact, we can look at the most popular way to generate Gaussian random variates called the Box-Muller transform. What this procedure does is it takes two uniform pseudo-random variates and turns them into a sample from a standard bivariate Gaussian distribution. So it consumes two pseudo-random numbers and produces two independent samples from the standard normal distribution. The main trick is to take advantage of the property that I just told you about for chi-squared distributions, that the sum of two squared Gaussian random variables is a draw from an exponential distribution, and exponential distributions are particularly easy to simulate from. So the Box-Muller transform essentially samples in polar coordinates. It first samples from the marginal of the distance from zero, and then it samples uniformly from the circle. You transform the point back into Cartesian coordinates, and just like that, you have a sample from a bivariate standard normal. Standard normal variates are the building blocks that we use to sample from more complicated Gaussian distributions. Let's look at the univariate case first. The key thing to remember is that the Gaussian distribution is closed under linear transformation. That means for a given mu and sigma squared, we can engineer a linear transformation that takes a standard normal random variate and turns it into a random variate with that mean and variance. The procedure is pretty simple. First, get a standard normal random variate using something like the Box-Muller transform. Then multiply that standard normal random variate by sigma, the standard deviation, or the square root of the variance. Finally, add on mu to get the mean you want. The procedure for generating multivariate Gaussian random variates is pretty much the same. You have to engineer a linear transformation. The thing that's more challenging now is we're going to need to decompose our covariance matrix sigma into something that looks like a A transpose. As before, the first thing we do is generate something from a standard normal Gaussian distribution. Just here, we'll need n of them. We take those and stack them into a vector in Rn. Now this is a draw from a multivariate Gaussian distribution with zero mean and identity covariance. Where things really deviate from the univariate case is that now we need to decompose the covariance matrix sigma into a matrix multiplied by its transpose. A very convenient way to do that is to use the Kolesky decomposition. The Kolesky takes a matrix sigma and produces a lower triangular L such that L times L transpose is sigma. Now you hit your standard normal random variate x on the left with L. 
Finally, you add in the mean mu. With this recipe, you can cook up samples from any multivariate Gaussian distribution that you want.